There's nothing like being outside. We get terribly toxic messaging about our aging. The outdoors is too dangerous for us, but we can't be what all that sort of societal messaging about our aging is telling us. And that's powerful. Caroline Paul has spent her entire life defying expectations and pushing the boundaries of what's possible. She was one of San Francisco's first female firefighters. She's a woman who's mountain biked the Bolivian Andes and written best-selling books. She pilots everything from planes to gyrocopters and is somebody who doesn't just surf, snowboard, skate, and skydive. This is somebody who hang glides, bungee jumps, and also wing walks. And on top of that, even pursued Olympic luge. Awe is when you can't quite grasp what's going on. All the patterns that you know don't make sense. And it certainly didn't make sense to be doing loops in midair at 3,000 feet attached by this one skinny little belt. It turns out awe is really good for us. When this unrepentant adrenaline junkie started contending with age, a new adventure emerged how to embrace her later decades with grace and a novel, more gentle kind of bravery. One that's more about awe than thrills and prioritizes community, mindset, purpose, and of course, the outdoors. It's a reinvention of sorts, this journey of Caroline's, all of which is thoroughly laid forth in her latest book, Tough Broad, which forms the basis of today's exploration into longevity, well-being, and meaning. There's really nothing between you and everything. Just get outside any way you can. Get outside further. Great to meet you. Thanks for doing this. Thank you. Really, really excited. Thanks, Rich. Did you fly down from San Francisco today in your gyrocopter? <laughs> I did not. I did not. Thank you. What is the for, what is the range on those things? I mean, as far as your heart will take you. I mean, you have to stop for gas. Yeah. So, but the, you know, the thing about the United States is there's all these tiny airports everywhere. It's and taxpayer funded. It's kind of amazing. Mm. I think left over from the postal service days when they started doing mail by plane. Yeah. I don't know. It's amazing. So what's the longest distance flight that you've made in one of those things? Well, I recently did. Thank you for asking. I, I recently did a cross country trip from the Bay Area in San Francisco to uh, Sedona, Arizona. Uh huh. And it wow. took four days. So it was over the Sierras, over Death Valley and over the Grand Canyon. Wow. It has to be scary flying over the Sierras in a gyrocopter. I mean, there's no like hood, right? Like you're, is it open air or do you pull the, can you pull a hood down over you? No, no, it was open cockpit. Open cockpit. Yeah. And what, at what altitude are you flying? I was flying at 10,000. Wow. Yeah. I had seven layers of clothes on. I mean, it's like a lawnmower. It is. Don't tell my mom that. <laughs> it is. That's crazy. Yeah. For me, the most nerve wracking before I did it was the Grand Canyon because of all the wind, the different wind. The crosswinds. and yeah, yeah, I had no idea. But like fear usually is, as soon as I was doing it, I wasn't scared anymore. Usually just kind of scared of the next thing. So. Are there close calls that you've had? It just feels so unstable because it's so tiny. Yeah. I mean, I've been flying since I was 20. Uh -huh. And so, yeah, I've had close calls and I've flown Cessnas and paragliders. So paragliding is sort of like hang gliding, but it's not as cool. Mm -hmm. It's like a wing shaped bed sheet, as I like to describe it. And um, then I went to flying hang gliders with motors. And now I fly gyrocopters. Right. How does that work? Is there, do you buy one? Do you lease it? Do you find some instructor to teach you how to do it? Or because you have a pilot, pilot's license already, it was a quick study? No, I'm not a quick study for, for much, sadly, but... That's hard to believe. There are... I did have some flying background when I picked up paragliding, but it's completely different because it's foot launched and there's really nothing between you and everything. Uh -huh. um, not like a Cessna, which is sort of like being in a car which is why I didn't really love them. And most of the aircraft that I was flying 
were not sort of under the purview of the FAA at the time. So mm -hmm. there were lots of my peers who were just sort of figure it out, but that's not really my way. I'd find somebody to teach me. Well, the gyrocopter is just sort of one box checked on a very long list of adventures and disciplines that you've explored over the course of an extremely interesting and, and colorful life. And as I sit across from you, you know, it's hard for me to see anyone else other than your identical twin sister, who I know a little bit. Um, who's awesome. Yeah, who's amazing and initially put us in touch. And I guess there's some similarities in, in the career paths that, that you guys have chosen, but you're also like very different people. She's this activist, actor. For people who don't know, she co-hosts the Switch for Good podcast with uh, Dotsie Bausch, who's a friend of the podcast and a personal friend. Um, and your brother is also an animal rights activist. So <laughs> you grew up in Connecticut with two activist siblings. That's interesting in and of itself. Like the Connecticut it's an part? unlikely, Cause... well, just, you know, like knowing what little I know about like where you grew up and, you know, what that kind of time was like, it's unlikely that there would be two ardent activists coming out of that environment. Well, three, because me, yeah. but actually my father, who was a very conservative banker, Republican, sort of thought Nixon should still be president and, you know, ardent Reaganite, he was an animal lover. And one of the stories in our family is how he saved a whole brood of tiny little ducklings by just scooping them from his pool filter. You know, he's a sort of buttoned up Midwestern guy. Um, and he knelt down on the Tar the concrete there and gave mouth to beak resuscitation to seven ducklings. Wow. So I come from a family of animal rescuers. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, here you are today uh, on, on the other side of putting your latest of a handful of books out into the world, Tough Broad. We're going to get into all of your adventures, the firefighting and all of that, uh, all of those experiences that have kind of led you to this point. But this book is qualitatively different in that it is kind of trying to understand and make sense of a new phase of life. And I think a reductive take would be something like, what happens when an unrepentant, you know, adrenaline junkie has to start contending with aging? And how do I embrace this period of life with a little bit of grace? But I think the more accurate way to capture it is that it is kind of a call to action, you know, to bravery, to reinvention, to you know, rethink the cultural mores and, and social tropes that prevent people from living a more fully uh, actualized, authentic experience in our later decades, especially with a particular lens on, on women and how those cultural mores, unfortunately, don't kind of encourage that way of thinking or being. It's actually also a quest. Like when I started this book, I really didn't know that much about fulfilling aging. And I, after looking at all the science and research, the, the book changed a lot from when I had originally proposed it. So walk me through the original idea to write this book. Like what, what motivated you to kind of explore this terrain? You know, after The Gutsy Girl, which I wrote um, for girls, which was sort of an exhortation for girls to learn bravery, to practice bravery and do that through the outdoors. And that, that, that seemed to strike a nerve with people. My publisher really wanted me to write The Gutsy Girl for my peers, for women. And I just didn't think I had anything to say to my peers because, I mean, I was different from a lot of them. I'm, you know, privileged and uh, don't have kids. I'm not going through sort of that phase of life. I'm queer. Uh, I, I'm white. There was just a lot that was very different. Mm -hmm. So I... I didn't think I had anything to say. So I really said, no, I'm not writing that book. I'm not writing. I said that for years. And then when I was 55, I was on my surfboard and I looked around and there were no women out there on the surf. And it was, it was sort of burly winter surf, but it was totally doable for someone who was a better surfer than me. There were men out there my age and older. And I started to realize I was seeing this over and over again, that women, when I was on my electric skateboard, when I was flying my experimental planes, there was just men my age and older, but no women. So as 60 was sort of beckoning on the horizon, I wondered, like, what is my own future going to look like? Mm -hmm. And so really, I went 
to ask women older than me what the outdoors was doing for their aging journey. And what did you find? You found a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, you I got wanted, more than you bargained for. Well, I wanted to keep the outdoors in my life, but I, when I saw no one around sort of my age, and I say no one, there were some, but very, very few. And I thought that I was my best self in the outdoors, present and thoughtful, a good teammate. And I wanted to keep it in my life. So I had a hypothesis. So I was that scientist going out with the hypothesis that outdoor adventure was important for us. And mm -hmm. I had just a vague idea. And I, again, yeah, you're right. I found so much more. The reason, though, let's start with, the, with what you discovered around the why there aren't as many women in their older decades in the outdoors. I mean, I had a feeling I knew why. And this book is full of science, but I did not delve into the science of this. I didn't set out to prove what I'm about to say, which is that we get terribly toxic messaging about our aging as women in this country. And I could have sort of cited all these studies, but every time I say mm -hmm. that, all the women start nodding. So, And the messages are basically that we're, you know, on the road to physical decline, definitely cognitively, you know, on our way to being pretty shaky. And we should probably narrow our lives, watch our bones. And certainly the uncertainty of the outdoors is too dangerous for us. Mm -hmm. And I knew that men weren't getting that messaging because they were out there with me in the outdoors. That's sort of the what I already knew. And just as I was about to go sort of interview women and talk to them about this psychology that was probably keeping them outside, the pandemic hit mm -hmm. and nobody wanted to talk to me. So I had to do a lot of research, just stay inside and um, be on the computer. And if nobody remembers anything about what I say, they should remember this because I think it applies to everybody. And that is that the studies show that the way we look at our own aging predicts how well we age. Mm -hmm. This gets into the work of uh, Ellen Langer, who's been on the podcast, who did that famous study where she took those groups of men and separated them, those elder men, put them in houses, one of which was adorned or draped in all of the nostalgic kind of knickknacks of, of their youth and aired on television, like the baseball game that played in 1950, whatever. And then the other group going into the same house where the same, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, the same drapings were there, but one group was told you're, you're to have this experience as if you are, you know, of that age. And the other group was told like, have the experience as you are now looking in the rear view mirror and like reflecting upon that, like with a nostalgic eye. And the group that was sort of instructed to channel their inner adolescent or whatever, uh, translated into a mindset shift that, that, you know, produced physiological longevity benefits. Did I say that right? I, I can't remember. It's been like a year since she came you on You know, honestly, I that. don't. The control group, I thought, was just in a house together. Eight mm. men in a house together I who think were they in their still 70s. had the same, they oh, were still they? all the same oh. stuff in the house. That It was just that they were told to approach it from a different point from of view. From a nostalgic yeah, yeah. point. Yeah, they were encouraged to wax nostalgic about their past, but they were very clearly felt like they're 70. Whereas the other house was completely submerged in themselves as 20 years younger, they, they couldn't talk about any event past that date of 1959, because mm -hmm. this took place in 1979. And all the newspapers were of that date. And they, there were only, there were no mirrors, so they couldn't see themselves, only photos of themselves at that age or younger. So I think what Langer was very interested in is this sort of immersion of your mind. And she predicted that the body would follow. And sure enough, when those men left that house, they were measured and all their metrics had improved. You know, their hearing, their grip strength. They were playing football. One guy like left his cane behind. She said it was like Lourdes. Yeah, it's really powerful. It's powerful. Mm -hmm. But it sounds woo-woo. You know, it does. Yeah. It sounds like. And I think at the time, well, first of all, it was too few people. It was only 16 total subjects. Mm -hmm. But that, I think, began her reckoning with the mind-body connection. And I was, did a lot of research for this book uh, on uh, Becca Levy, who is sort of an acolyte of Dr. Langer. 
And she wrote a book called Breaking the Age Code. And she's the one where I came upon the studies, but though, though they've been replicated by a lot of people that say, you know, the way we look at our own aging predicts how well we age. So, mm-hmm. I mean, if you have a negative view of your own aging, you have a statistically higher chance of a cardiac event earlier and cognitive decline earlier. This is all exacerbated, of course, if you're a woman, because the bar for a man to kind of overcome that and have that mindset shift or a change in perspective is one that doesn't meet the cultural resistance that a woman does. So when you talk about this idea that, you know, women as they age are kind of channeling a lifetime of programming that they're too frail or that it's unsafe or scary or too risky. That's just the latest chapter in a lifetime of, you know, being inculcated with messaging that the world is a scary place and you're better off staying inside and making sure that you're, you know, taking care of yourself. All of this, some of it is overt, some of it is subtle, but when, by the time you're 60, like, it's been 60 years of that kind of seeping into your consciousness. So overcoming that and reframing your relationship with the world as one of possibility and adventure as, as opposed to one of, you know, a scary one that's filled with risks that you should be very afraid of is a leap. It's a harder leap, I guess is what I'm saying, than it would be for a 60-year-old man. And I don't know that they're getting those messages uh, when they, as they age, but I know they're getting something that's negative that the men are. I just didn't feel like I was competent enough to actually write mm-hmm. a book for men on this. And yeah, I mean, I think it's such a leap that it's, and even when we know it, you know, I think every woman knows that the messages that they get feel unfair, but part of us believes it too. I really felt like Just having a positive mantra and saying, you know, I am strong, I am brave. That's not going to, that's not, that's not Mm -hmm. enough. What I began to realize as I went on my interviews is that it was going outside that in itself was such a direct rebuke to this messaging that we get that your sort of whole body, maybe in a Langer-esque way, um, begins to believe otherwise. Because when you go outside... You know, you, you, there's so much uncertainty outside. So one of the um, people that I went to interview was this group of boogie boarders in San Diego. I don't know if you've heard of them, called the Wave Chasers. Mm-hmm. And they're made up of women who are between 60 and 80. And they go in the Pacific Ocean three times a week. And frankly, I went down there because I was interested in... Um, how boogie boarding could just be like a gateway to just getting outside because it's such a simple sport. Right. And in fact, like I'll have to say that as a surfer, I was ki- kind of looked down on it. To yeah. Be and I'm not, a, I'm a <laughs> yeah. bad surfer. So here's a, ba- I was a bad surfer who looked down on boogie boarding, but I wanted to include it because I, I could see that it would be getting in the water would be fun as we age. And even the wave chasers told me, they said, you know, you don't have to know anything to boogie board. You don't even have to be fit. <laughs> By the way, boogie boarding, I think most people know, but I will say what it is. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, I imagine everyone knows it, but maybe there's a few that don't. Well, it's just like you get on the, uh, like a flotation kind of tray, like looks like a cafeteria tray on your, on your stomach. so condescending. Oh yeah, I know, right? (laughs) It's a sport for kids, man. (laughs) You sort of ride the wave to shore and these the wave chasers didn't even ride waves. They rode the white water to shore. So it was after the wave had broken. And so I go to interview them, and one of the women t- tells me, uh, boogie boarding changed my life. <laughs> and I was inside like, what? How can such a simple sport change your life? And basically what she told me is, you know, look at the Pacific Ocean. It's cold. It's, it's windy out. I have to make all these decisions about waves. I'm helping my friends have fun. I, I'm committed three times a week. I'm part of something bigger than myself. And here I am, I'm 62. And what I saw is that what she was doing was upending her own expectations of herself because Mm -hmm. just by boogie boarding and, or as I found really any outdoor activity, again, like what it asks of us makes us realize we can't be what all that sort of societal messaging about our aging Mm -hmm. is telling us. Mm -hmm. And that's powerful. Yeah. 
I'm thinking of the fact that it was only in 2021 that the Olympics made the 1,500-meter freestyle a women's event. Originally, it was just considered, well, that's too rigorous, it's too long. The, 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 the female form, you know, is not going to be able to handle that. You know, like, why did it take until 2021 to make what has always been an Olympic event for men in swimming a female event? Why? <laughs> well, I'm what? asking you. It's like, it's obvious, right? It's an artifact. It's a relic of a time that, you know, I think we've progressed past. But the fact that it wasn't until 2021 tells you that there's still something very indelible about this mm -hmm. and insidious and, you know, probably subtle more often than not, but nonetheless there. And it starts with young girls. Like, this is something you talk a lot about. Like, young girls, I don't know what it's like now for young girls getting into sport, but, you know, when you and I were growing up, it wasn't always exactly encouraged. It was sort of like, well, that's for the boys and, you know, you guys go over there. And so fast forward from, you know, 1970 to now, if that's the messaging you got when you were a young girl and now you're in your later years when the culture is constantly reinforcing this idea that when women reach a certain age, they're kind of dismissed as beauty fades and they're less relevant. Of course, that's going to lead to isolation and, you know, a lack of self-esteem and, and, you know, more challenges around trying to find purpose and meaning in your life. But it is the outdoors that kind of fires on all cylinders and hits all of these pillars that you talk about in the book around, you know, staying young as we biologically mature. Yeah, I never use that term staying young because I want to make it clear that I am 60, almost 61 right now. And I really, um, I want to be in this stage fully. Uh, I think a lot of people, it's confusing and it was really hard to transmit that I want us to have, to look at this stage as exhilarating and adventurous. And in fact, sort of claim a lot of the attributes that youth claims for themselves, you know, a little bit of recklessness uncertainty, fun, play, all that. So, but I don't, I don't mistake that for wanting to be younger. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a difference between, a big difference between kind of embracing this phase versus trying to pretend that it's not happening and kind of cosplaying a young person. Going out and having adventures in a healthy way is fantastic. But if you're doing it to like prove to yourself that you're not getting older, like that could be maybe a not so healthy well, version of doing the same thing. That's what I did when I was yeah. young. I was proving <laughs> to somebody when I did yeah. all these crazy adventures, like I'm, yeah, the cool thing about being where I am now, you're younger than me, but is that it is this intersection of sort of a lot of experience and just sort of a changing mindset and a, and a changing hormonal system. Like my hormones have changed in a way that's really kind of cool too and is a, really allowing me to enjoy this. And in fact, of all the women that I interviewed who were older than me, they all told me that the 60s was their favorite decade, mm. which is definitely not what the culture tells sure. us. Sure. Yeah. The science proves that out too. I mean, Arthur Brooks talks about this all the time. I think he, maybe he uses the 50s, but either way, like these are the stages of life in which people seem to be, and the science bears out, are the most happy. But that's not what we believe or what we think or what the culture is telling us. I know it's odd. It's very odd. Yeah. Yeah. I think it would be good to kind of go back a little bit and, and kind of canvas your journey uh, that led to this place. So you grew up in Connecticut. You ended up at Stanford. You were a couple of years ahead of me. And there you were on the rowing team. Yeah. Uh, but you also got into, like, afterwards, you got into luge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to hear Does the luge story. Does everyone know luge? Should I explain yeah. that sport too? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I, when I was at Stanford, I actually did it while I was at Stanford, and I took oh, you some did. time off, yeah. Oh, you stopped out to? To pursue this. You know, wow. it turns out when I was at Stanford, first of all, luge at the time in the 80s was a very obscure sport. I mean, hardly anyone had heard of it. But there turned out that the number, the top American in the sport was a woman named Bonnie Warner, and she went to Stanford. And she wanted to sort of expand the sport of luge. So she held these trials 
at Stanford. And I went with my friend Blaze. He was a fellow friend of mine, a fellow rower. We, we were pilots together, so we flew together. And uh, so we both decided we'd go to these tryouts. And basically, it, it, so luge is that sport. It's a sledding sport where you lie on your back and you sort of control the, the sled with your, your legs and you go at high speeds around a, a track. Mm-hmm. To sort of see who could do this or who would be primed for this, she put us on, uh, Bonnie put us on these sleds, but they had wheels and we went down Alpine Road. Oh, wow. Yeah. That seems more dangerous. Yeah. And I know it's like cars coming. Yeah. There's, <laughs> there's trees, there's things you can hit. Like if you're on the loose track, like maybe you wipe out, but you're just going to slide on your butt to the, to the bottom, right? That seems really scary. Yeah, I don't, For people I don't, that don't know, Alpine Road is a, it's a preferred cycling route in Palo Alto um, that's very steep and windy. Well, we ended up going to Tahoe to train also. So wow. I made this, this sort of, I think because I could do a lot of push-ups. They're, they're, Bonnie was awesome. But she just wanted to see like who had sort of the, the, the spine to do it, I think, more. So Blaze and I both made it. So we went and then I just stayed. Uh, school had started again for another quarter and I, I decided I wanted to sort of pursue this Olympic dream. Though, I mean, the truth is, Rich, is that I was terrible at it. <laughs> I was really a bad loser. But it's OK to be a bad loser when there's only like there were only like 12 women doing yeah. it, right? Yeah. So you moved to Lake Placid. I did. Right? To pursue this. And they gave you a nickname. Oh, yes, they did. I'm sorry that, you're, that you do such good research. <laughs> yeah, my nickname was Crash. And um, people would actually gather at this one corner. A lot of times, and they would tell me this, a friend of mine told me, you know, it was freezing. It was below freezing. We wanted to go to the warming hut. And then we heard your name called. So instead of going to the warming hut, we went to, you know, corner 14, which is where I would always have these spectacular crashes. And people just wanted to see if I would survive them. The thing about losing is you just had to cross the finish line with your fingertips touching your sled. So oh, wow. inevitably, I would be sliding across. So you could just be line. hanging on to yeah. it as you're sliding down on your butt. Yeah. I didn't realize that. Wow. Is it the same track as the bobsled track or does luge have its own track? Now I have to remember. Uh, we, did, we had our own track and then a bobsled. I think, I think we had our own track at the time. But often they do share yeah. tracks. Yeah. And then how is it different from Skeleton? Because that looks very similar to Luge. Skeleton is amazing. And at the time, they were this really ragtag team who they were using the bobsled track. They were part of the bobsled association. And basically, Skeleton is face first instead of feet first. So, mm. and of course, like I was doing Luge, but crashing constantly and trying to make the national team. And I saw this sport that was made up of people who basically wore jeans and hiking boots and motorcycle helmets. And they were going down this track. And I said, I'd like to try that. And the guy said, great, but we don't have any women. And I said, great. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Now I'll be number yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the ice is, you know, millimeters from your eyes, basically. Wow. And you're going very fast. And there, nobody knew what they were doing. So it was almost like being a kid and being on a sled. You just sort of put your feet down when you think you should. And there was a lot of crashing and, and scraping. And so screaming. with luge, you're steering and controlling with your feet, but skeleton, is you're just like using your body weight? Is that yeah, body weight, you're using your shoulders. and But I remember very clearly, like you would put your toes down into the ice to try to make yourself turn. They, uh -huh. I wow. mean, I think now they've really perfected the sport, but back then it wasn't, it wasn't an official hmm. Olympic sport. And it wasn't, it was kind of, I, I don't know if it was new, but it was certainly new to the United States. No one knew what they were doing. So you were like 11th out of 12th, or did, but you made the national, you were like on the national team. Well, so I did do nationals and um, and I crashed, but I did cross the finish line holding onto my sled. And I was a really new loser at the time. I was 11th out of 12 women. And I think that honestly, like somebody <laughs> dropped out. I think I, I at any rate, I um, did not make the national team uh -huh. until a couple months later when someone dropped out. And by then I was training on my own in Germany, trying to keep up with everybody. And I got a call that said, you've made the national team. Where are you? And I said, I'm in Germany. Mm. And so. 
training for what in Germany? Luge. For luge. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. So With the German team. Oh, with the German team. Oh, my God. But at some point, you go back to Stanford then? And you, you mentioned that you were doing this with a friend who was a pilot buddy of yours. So just for clarity, like, did you already have your pilot license when you were in college? Yeah, yeah I did. Wow. Yeah. So what happened was, you know, I, it was an amazing experience to be among all these Olympic athletes from all around the world when I was training at Lake Placid, because all these teams from everywhere would come and train at Lake Placid. And and I saw and, and became friends with people of very high caliber with amazing grit and discipline. But what I realized is that I didn't think that I didn't want my life to be that myopic. Mm -hmm. And so by the time I was training in Germany, I realized I don't think I want this Olympic dream anymore. It was hard to give up. I mean, eventually, <laughs> who knows whether I would have made the Olympic team, but I then decided to go back to school mm -hmm. and I became really honestly rich. I'm a jack of all trades now. I don't really specialize in anything. Yeah, but the thing that comes to mind for me is is this tension between if you want to be like the absolute best in a specific thing, you do have to have a myopic kind of perspective in life that's focused on that one thing. And the adventurous life, which is the life that you have led, is a sort of jack of all trades thing where you're kind of you know, traipsing from one thing to the next and, you know, where, where novelty is just as important as, as anything else. It's not about being the best. It's about having the experience. Yeah. I mean, I think those metrics aren't in the outdoors. I mean, I was, so I was part of a all women's whitewater team that was doing first descents at the time. So they, that means you, we were going down rivers that had never been explored before by anybody. So that's a metric. I mean, that we were trying to be the best in that way. But mm -hmm. in general, my outdoor exploits, there is no gauge like that. You just, I got on my mountain bike and went through the Bolivian Andes. And I, no one had gone through the Bolivian Andes, not because I was a great mountain biker, but because mountain bikes were newly, it was 1986 or seven. So they were newly invented, really. Yeah. And so in general, you know, you're, it's kind of you against the weather and, you know, your own sense of whether you can do something. But you do have one instance that predates all of this in which you were trying to be the best when you were 13. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess I, I kind of want to forget this, but then I did write about it and talk about it. Yes, so. you've talked about it a lot. I have. Um, but it's a great story. Yeah, I was very obsessed with the Guinness Book of World Records like we all were, right? Sure, I up? remember having that book when I was a kid and paging through it and yeah. Tallest man in the world. Longest fingernails. Yeah, all of that. With yeah. those black and white photos. Yeah. This is what we did before the internet. I know. Yeah. It's like, it was sort of huge and thick. And yeah, so I wanted to set a world record, but I realized that I had no skill at all at anything. So I decided to set a world record in something that was so primal and <laughs> sort of intuitive to, for us all. And that was crawling. So... I, the record at the time, according to the book, was 12 and a half miles, mm -hmm. I think. I think that's right. And, um, and I enlisted a friend, and we decided we would go around the high school track. And back then, you know, it was a feat to sort of get all the information. They had to write to the Guinness Book of World Records. They told us what we needed to do. We had to get media. So there is a photo <laughs> of us. And then you had to get witnesses. And so we had people who would, you know... And then we didn't even train. We didn't even, we just, we were young and we thought yeah, that let's do 12 it. and a half miles, that's yeah. easy. It and you did it on a high school track? Yeah, so it uh -huh. could be measured. Right. Maybe it would have been better to do it in the grass. Oh, totally. Yeah. <laughs> there were so many things. I mean, we, <laughs> we got furniture pads because we're like, what's big and fluffy? Oh, uh, furniture pads. And we tied them around our knees with bandanas and we wore jeans. And jeans, it's like denim is the worst thing right against your skin. Yeah, and we just set off. And how far did you get? Well, my friend dropped out at five miles and I kept going and it got dark and then it started to rain. And at eight and a half miles, I, I was pulled off the track actually because my, my minders were like, you're kind of hallucinating. And I was, I think I, had a, I was a little hypothermic. But really, Rich, inside, I was glad. Like, this I could not with. remember why I was there. Like, why am I doing something this dumb? 
But I'll tell you, it taught me this amazing lesson, which is that, you know, when you're, and you know this from what you do, when you're doing these arduous things, you can't, in the middle of it, you're like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever done. Mm -hmm. I want to stop right now. But even in my young, uh, callow mind, part of me was like, yeah, you want to stop, but there was a reason you wanted to do this. And you don't know what it is now, but at one point it made sense. And that person is, you know, has her wits about her way more than you do right now. So just keep at it. And uh, so I did end up going like eight and a half miles, which, but sadly, didn't break the world. All chafed and bloodied. Oh, yeah. I had scars on my knees for a very long time. Over the last decade of hosting this podcast, my mission has been to engage in what I consider to be critically important conversations about the things that matter most in life. While I'm immensely grateful for the growth of this show, I've also come to realize that my voice alone is not enough. This mission cannot be a solitary endeavor. So I wanted to find a way to help amplify other meaningful voices. And the result is Voicing Change Media, this beautiful consortium of thinkers, storytellers, artists, and visionaries, all committed to fostering meaningful exchanges, intentionally curated for those committed to the path of self-discovery. Together, we're creating a space of growth a space of understanding where every exchange has the potential to enrich our lives and catalyze profound personal and planetary change. Visit voicingchange.media to learn more and subscribe. Well, what's interesting to me about this story is you say, like, I realized I wasn't good at anything. Like, clearly you are good at many things, but maybe what you're best at is, is you know, a certain sense of self, like that borders on audacity, like for a young person to say, I'm going to break a Guinness book of world records, you know, that takes a belief in oneself, uh, especially at such a young age to say like, I have this dream and I'm going to make it happen, even though I'm young and I'm not going to train for it or whatever. Like, I think that's really cool. And there's a tenacity to it because I also know in the wake of missing the mark and not breaking this record, that you petitioned the Guinness Book of World Records to establish a woman's record, right? Which there wasn't one. And when they denied you, you decided that you were going to sue them and <laughs> tried to get your dad's <laughs> lawyer friends involved in I this. Feel like, like you talked to my mom. <laughs> this is publicly uh, you know, available information. I, I'm by the embarrassed way. about that because I don't think there should be like a, a gender difference between. But I like that. I like yeah, that. Like, I'm going. not backing down from this, <laughs> you know, like I'm going for it. Like the gumption, you know, the, the self-confidence that that requires. You know, I really appreciate that you say like that I had belief in myself or, or sort of confidence. I think honestly, Rich, I think I'm an identical twin and being an identical twin has, has shaped me more than anything because I think that really the person in the world that I want to impress is my own twin sister. Mm. First of all, we've always been compared, which is really hard. And um, we don't, we don't like that. That's the world doing it to us, but also we just want to live up to the other person. So we actually were swimmers as well when we grew up. And one of the things that we used to do is work out extra after. We had a sense that we were not necessarily really skilled, but we were very, very dogged. Mm-hmm. And so we would do these extra workouts in our, in our lake. And invariably, there'd be this huge fight in the middle of the lake because we thought that the other one was doing serpentines, like not in a straight line more than we were, which meant that they were getting more of a workout than uh-huh. we were. Oh my <laughs> and that God. That was not allowed. We had to be exactly the same. So I think most everything I do is like in the hopes that my twin sister will be like. That's interesting. Do you think there's also like something else, like this need to prove to maybe not just yourself, but to the world or, you know, what else was going on in your childhood home that you can credit with giving you this kind of drive? Well, I think I wanted to differentiate myself also from my, from my twin as well. So it was that weird balance between not wanting to be competitive with her, like we had different swim strokes, for instance, and not wanting to be compared, but wanting to also be my own self, maybe. Uh-huh. And here's the irony. <laughs> so I really, both of us were obsessed with the Guinness Book of World Records. And uh, 
So there I was trying to break in and I failed. Well, years and years later, my twin sister made it into the Guinness Book of World. Oh, she did? I didn't yeah. know that. For yeah. what? What did she do? She was on the most watched. She was one oh. of the cast members on the most watched show in the whole world, which is Baywatch. Baywatch at is the in time. the Guinness Book of World Records. It was at the, yes, at wow. one point. Maybe it's been surpassed by something, but yeah, for, for many years it was in. And so she... Did Does she let you know? She... Oh, no, she's not really like that. <laughs> But yeah. But in the moment, it was like at the time so. after you did that, she didn't then go into the book and try to find some other record that she was going to attempt <laughs> she as, might a, have. as a I response don't know. She didn't to. Tell, no, she yeah. didn't. Wow. In any event, back to Stanford. So, so you study communications with this idea of becoming a journalist or a documentary filmmaker, and then you kind of go into journalism uh, with public. It was a public radio in Berkeley. I was doing odd jobs and then I volunteered at this radio station just to sort of, and I was doing some documentary film as well. I was uh, about to go to grad school, actually. And so, yeah, I was volunteering at KPFA in Berkeley. Was that a great volunteer situation where they, you didn't push paper, they threw you right away into basically reading the news on air, which is what I did for a couple of days a week for mm. a couple of years. And you have this idea that you're going to infiltrate uh, a certain institution and pull the covers on wrongdoings? Well, at the time, it was 1986, 87, I think somewhere around there. And all these stories were coming across my desk about the San Francisco Fire Department, about how s sexist and racist they were. And there was a test coming up. And I thought, oh, why don't I do an undercover story? Like, I'll go pretend I'm interested in being a firefighter and take the test. And so that's what I did. Yeah. What happened instead? Well, I kept passing each, um, you know, gate. And, um, and finally they called, they called me and said, y you're, you're in the next class. And it was very ironic, Rich, because honestly, first of all, I was shocked. And I thought, well, I can't be a firefighter because I'm graduating from Stanford. And what would my dad say? You know, he paid for Stanford. Mm -hmm. But here I was investigating an institution for their racism and sexism, and I can't think of a more classist response. It was really embarrassing, but I was too young to really realize. But basically, I think, you know, I had some isms I had to <laughs> deal with myself. Uh, but the upshot was, I said, no, I said, I defer. I defer. Can I defer? Which meant I was just put off the decision. And I went on this mountain bike expedition with, my, with one friend through the Bolivian Andes. And came back and st still hadn't sorted it out. And then the earthquake hit, 1989 earthquake. And I began to read these stories in the newspaper of such brave, honorable acts by these firefighters who I had simply boxed as like racist and sexist. And I realized, oh, there's so much more to this than I know. And by then, also, the job had kind of seemed perfect for me. I mean, I got into journalism wanting to be paid to go out and have adventures in some mm -hmm. way. And here I was suddenly being asked to be a firefighter. Right. And to have adventures in the, in the context of service, really. Yeah. And I realized it's just how, how you know, narrow-minded I was being. So... And you were a firefighter for 14 years? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, I'm so grateful for that experience. Yeah. It was full of, it made me s such a better person. So what happened when you broke this news to your investment banker dad <laughs> that you were going to embrace this firefighting career? How did that go down? Honestly, I think my dad wanted me to be happy. I had a little less pressure on me because I was a girl in some ways underestimated. I think, you know, for, for the career that I picked wasn't necessarily as important as my brother's. Mm. But I think he thought it was a phase and, uh, and he was worried. I mean, they, everyone knows what firefighters do, but there was a part of him that really liked that I was breaking out of a box. You have amazing stories uh, from this, this period of your, of your life. In your mind, kind of looking back on that experience, what do people not understand about the firefighter experience? I mean, I think that, that first of all, firefighters definitely get their due. We are seen as sort of heroic and um, the, the work we do is important. But for me personally, uh, I will say that 
running into a fire was not the difficult part of that job. The difficult part of that job actually was the sort of compassion that you need when you are going on medical calls. Those are the not those were never the sexy calls. You know, mm-hmm. they're not the big fires, the big adventures. We're not rappelling off a bridge. We were doing very small things like uh you know, being there at at a moment that's maybe that person's worst moment of their whole life. Correct me if I'm wrong, but aren't the majority of the calls that you get medical emergency related? No, you are right. And back then it was a little bit, when I got in 1989, doing medical calls was kind of new-ish. Um, and then it became, yeah, the bulk of what we do. But there was still a lot of fires when I came in. Mm-hmm. One of those fires, uh, there was an explosion. Yeah. What was that called? What's that called when the gases are released and it gets very quiet? And then, oh, yeah. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. There's flash a, what's over. that word? Yeah. Flash. Yeah. 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 I've been in a couple explosions, um, but that was, I went to a fire and they couldn't find the seat of the fire. And by then I was a member of what's called the rescue squad. And the rescue squad, we were sort of the Batman of the fire department. We do all the technical rescues. We repel off bridges and, and we do the surf rescues and we do hazmat and we do rescues and fires. Our job is simply to go in there and look for people. And I also look for animals, actually. I pulled out a lot of animals, too. We didn't go in with a hose. We went in with an axe and sort of just your, you know, kind of a prayer. And at this one fire, they just couldn't find the seat of it. So they asked the squad to take a hose in and see if we, what we could do. So we were crawling down a hallway. And ahead of me was my um, friend Frank and Andy. And I was in a separate crew with Victor. It was like any fire. It felt initially like any fire. Very dark. Can't see anything. Very hot. But there was something off about it. And it was, I think that it was very quiet. It got very quiet. And then all of a sudden there was a huge explosion and we were blown out of the hallway. And what we later realized is that there had been a flashover, which is when a room gets so hot that everything reaches its combustion temperature at the same time, including the particles in the air. So basically the air explodes. Wow. It kills a lot of firefighters. It's a really dangerous situation. And we had been lucky that it wasn't in the hallway because we would have. But we were blown out of the hallway and uh, it was... Uh, one of the most, I will say, I, I, I didn't get scared a lot. And that's not because I'm a, like a hyper brave person per se. I think I just was more afraid of not being a good firefighter than I was of a fire. But I have to say that that day, that was a f- very frightening yeah. moment. And in that, there was a moment where Frank looked around, said, is everyone here? Is everyone here? And we realized that Victor wasn't my partner was not in the room with us. And I remember very clearly thinking, oh, I am not going back in there. And meanwhile, Frank is incredibly brave, competent firefighter. He immediately has turned and he's going back where we came to, to look for Victor. And I remember that moment of like, whoa, is this my limit? This might be my limit. And then the next second. Limit with to- fear, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. And I'd never experienced that. And that scared me more than anything. Next second, I'm right on Frank's heels and I'm in the hallway and we find Victor. He had gotten blown in uh, the other direction. He was fine. But that, that was a really eye-opening experience because I had met myself, basically. And so what do you make of that? Like kind of meeting your, your outer edge of your fear tolerance? I didn't like it. <laughs> yeah. And I, I lucky I got to, I mean, have you been there? Uh, I mean, not in an extreme, you know, kind of example that you just shared. Uh, I would have to think about that. I'm not sure. But I guess I'm asking because I'm curious about like the level of intention you had about trying to find that edge. Like what part of your desire to be a firefighter had to do with pushing the outer edges of your fear tolerance or, you know, basically, you know, flirting with the adrenaline rush of, of being in such a, a, a dangerous job that puts you in these high stakes environments. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. The, a, a big part of me wanted that constant sort of test. I think, you know, I have failed to tell you that I was actually a pretty fearful child. 
You know, when I grew up, I was pretty shy and I was scared of a lot of things. So I think like a lot of people who are sort of <sighs> do these sort of hyper brave things, they doth protest a little much. And mm. I put myself in this category. So I think we're fear. We're, we're just constantly trying to prove to ourselves. And I'm also intrigued by fear um, because I think that, well, first of all, that we're often as scared of something that's about to happen. So not that's happened. That hallway situation is a great example. The flashover had happened. It was actually very safe right now. It had, you know, cleared, it had ventilated in some way. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, you know, that our emotions are not keeping up with our brain. So prior to that moment where you had that experience where you're like, okay, that's too much or I'm at my limit. But I'm mean, going can I just say, okay, I yeah. then went. I managed to push you still, past yeah, the you, limit. You still, I, you did. Okay, so the I level, the, the ceiling got that. raised on that. Nonetheless, prior to that, was there some sense of youthful invincibility? Like, did you have that, like, uh, you know, nothing can touch me kind of sense of yourself? I'm sure. I yeah. mean, yes. And I'm sure, and I don't even know if it was that conscious. I think that's what we just carry with us as, as young mm -hmm. people. All right, so what is your relationship with fear today? Well, I've always thought fear was important. It's, it, it is important. We have to look at it, but it's just one emotion to assess a situation. So I think my f relationship with fear is, is the same. I think that I am pretty dogmatic about it, and I simply look at it, use it as a way to decide whether to go forward. And, and usually I go forward because I feel like there are other emotions that I have that I want in that situation. Such as? Uh, exhilaration, exploration, curiosity. You know, fear, it's also often not, it's not just the timing is wrong with fear that we're always about what's about to happen. And then when it happens, so you're scared when you go walking of that you might see a bear. Then you see a bear. Now you're not scared of seeing a bear. You're, you're scared the bear is going to attack you. Then it does. It's attacking you. And now you're scared that you're going to get mortally wounded. And then you get mortally wounded. Now you're scared you're going to die. Like you're never yeah. scared of what's actually happening. And similarly, I think, especially women, they don't have a, a matched fear to the situation. So in the book, I talk about this game that I play called What's the Worst That Can Happen? That's what I, when I go out with my friend, Sophia, we go on these mini adventures and she tends to be a little bit more anxious about things than I do. So we're going paddleboarding at night with no moon and pretty high winds because we want to see bioluminescence. And so we start playing this, what's the worst that could happen game, which is basically when we ask each other, what's the worst that can happen? And usually people go immediately to, we could die. Mm -hmm. But once you say it, you're, you're like, well, maybe I won't die. I mean, dying is, but we could fall in the water and get hypothermia. Well, not really, because you have a wetsuit on and you're also attached to your board. So you get right back on or we could get lost. Well, the wind is pushing us inland. We're not going to go out to sea. So what's the worst that could happen? OK, we'll be on our board for eight hours. It's going to be uncomfortable. You know, so we keep just sort of whittling it mm -hmm. down. And by the end, we go out on our boards because... There's nothing bad is going to happen that's worth the cool thing that we're going to see, which is bioluminescence. Mm. How have you avoided the trap of always chasing like the next thrill? Like as somebody who, who has a relationship with adrenaline, I've seen this happen with a lot of people. Like they'll do something extraordinary. It gives them, you know, a heightened experience. And... And then it just always has to be topped and more extreme and more extreme and more extreme. Mm. And it gets to the point where, you know, it becomes very unhealthy or, you know, rationality gives way to an irrational kind of relationship with risk. That's a really good question. That just never happened to me, I, I don't think. Did it? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I, I mean, I think I guess I'm thinking about like the healthy pursuit of of adventure versus the unhealthy one. Like if you're identity or your ego is too wrapped up in some accomplishment or how you'll be perceived if you climb this mountain, et cetera, then once you've done it and you realize you're still the same person, then you end up having to climb a higher one, you know, to kind of get that same feeling or, you know, sense of self because 
because there's something inside you, some emotional need that's not getting met, I suppose. Honestly, I think a lot of people, I didn't really talk about a lot of the things that I did. So for instance, when I was a firefighter, nobody knew I was a whitewater rafter. They didn't know I'd done first ascents in like, you know, uh, Australia or Borneo or they didn't, no one knew because I didn't really talk about it. I mean, before social media, it was different. And so I don't know that I got that sort of, um, maybe I do now because I've certainly written about it now, but now I'm older. So whatever I get, the accolades I might get for being brave, I don't know. I'm sort of embarrassed about who I was when I was younger. I don't, I I like that person. Okay. Why? I don't know. She, she had a lot to prove and she was nice. She was nice, but she was, I say this in the book too. She wasn't having fun a lot of the time. I was trying to prove maybe to my sister, I don't know, Mm -hmm. or to myself, but I don't really don't think it was to other people. Mm -hmm. I don't remember ever talking a lot about it. And I think my friends would back that up. And in each circle, I had people that I admired. So for instance, when I was a paraglider, uh, I had my friend Lars Holbeck, who was an incredible outdoorsman of people from the 80s would have heard of him. He's and we sort of learned to paraglide together and we went paragliding on paragliding trips. And I definitely respected him and wanted him to be impressed by me. Mm-hmm. And so we went to Brazil and I was going to learn how to mountain fly or fly thermals, thermal fly. Um, and before then, all I'd done was sort of this boating along ridge, ridge lines, which is just a lift from the cliff itself. And it's pretty predictable. You can see you can figure out what the lift band is and it's not super gnarly. And so Lars wanted to go to Brazil and I was like, I'll go with you. And he wanted to do thermal flying there. So it's pretty epic. So thermal flying is just simply the hot air that comes off the plains of Brazil and rises. And that's the way you fly. You basically fly from one thermal to another like a bird does. Mm. It keeps you at a certain elevation because the heat is rising. Right. Yeah. And you can't see it. It's columns of air and they can be very robust, but you can deduce where they are. So it's kind of cool as an outdoors person, you're sort of, you're reading nature. So you can deduce where they are based on the birds and on the clouds. Because when hot air rises, it cools and condenses into clouds. Wow. So I went with Lars and I'd never mountain flown before. And so he gave me this primer and he's one of those people who's really good at everything. The exact opposite of me. He's just really good at things, which means that he sometimes like doesn't really give you the full lesson on how to do it. And I'm sure I also postured like, I know what I'm doing. And I didn't ask any questions either because I didn't want to look like I didn't really know or I was trepidatious. I didn't want that to be obvious. And so I launch and I find a thermal and I'm super happy with myself and I start rising. And I found a thermal because I saw a little cumulus cloud, uh, a little puffy cloud in birds. So you go, I went after that. And then I got kicked out of that thermal because you eventually either you rise Mm -hmm. to the top or you, I found another one. And this one was really robust. I knew it because we have this, you can't really tell that you're rising, except we had this auditory machine and an altimeter sort of thing that told you not not only that you were rising, but how fast you were rising. And I was rising fast. And what I had mistakenly done, what I didn't really know was I'd picked a thermal that was rising under a cumulo nimbus cloud, not a cumulus cloud. And that meant I was being pulled into a building thunder cloud. Whoa. Yeah. And this was all because I had done what you're kind of talking about. I was like, I didn't want to, I wanted to be admired for (laughs) my future thermal flying abilities, which were nil. The thermal flying guru, (laughs) you wanted him to smile upon you. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so I was, basically what was happening is I was being what we call cloud sucked. And I I knew about it because it had happened to two champion uh, paragliders not that much earlier. And one had died immediately. He'd gotten th- uh, pulled up into the thundercloud and there's a storm going on in there. So he, his clothes were ripped off. His paraglider was ripped to shreds and he fell to his death. And then during the same competition, another 
paraglider also got pulled out, I think into the same cloud, and she was pulled up and lost consciousness. But her equipment stayed intact by some miracle, and she was spit out of the cloud at 32,000 feet. Whoa. Yeah. Do you have a chute on you? We have an emergency chute, yeah. But for the guy that, you know, he lost consciousness and then everything's ripped to shreds, I don't, there was nothing that he could do. For her, she was unconscious. I think her main chute was still intact for some reason. And there is just a big storm going on inside that cloud when this happens. But her ground crew could see all this and they could see how high she was based on her instrumentation. And uh, she gained consciousness at about 10,000 feet, I think, and she managed to land. Mm. But I knew all this, so I knew what was happening. As soon as I look up and it starts to gray out and I see, oh my God, I can't, I'm not stopping like I should be. There's something that you can do, which is called stalling your wing, which is basically making it not fly anymore, which is basically like pulling it and it becomes nothing and you drop like a stone. And I had done this maneuver, but it's really scary. And back then the equipment was in its really in nascent stages. It was a very new sport for at least here in America. And um, I didn't want to do a stall. <laughs> I was more scared of the stall than I was of being pulled into a thundercloud, which was not a smart move. Again, fear was not my friend at that time. It was making, making me think the wrong things. But when you reinflate it after a stall back then, you could never, first of all, everything could be tangled. You could fall into your wing. It was just, mm. it was a move that mm-hmm. was pretty, pretty risky. But so was getting <laughs> pulled yeah. into a thundercloud. Yeah. But there's something unique about just falling, right? That's going to override your nervous system. Yeah. It just was like, no, don't do that. So I basically did, uh, I made my wing very tiny because that usually works. Mm -hmm. Tiny wing, you can just, but it didn't work. And I kept, now I was completely whited out. And I really had only milliseconds before, like, I don't know, I was going to reach whatever storm was in the cloud. And then I did what we call a spiral die, which is in big ears, that tiny, I did this sort of radical diving maneuver and it got me out. Wow. What was the highest uh, altitude that you were at? I have no idea. You don't even know. <laughs> no. Is that the kind of scariest thing that's happened in all your death-defying adventures? I felt so dumb after that. I felt so embarrassed that I had been so dumb. I should have seen that it was a building cumulonimbus. Yeah, I would say that was scariest in so many ways. Like I was scared of my own judgment. I was scared of the decisions I'd made. And, but, you know, ultimately I lived, so... I guess I ultimately yeah. made the right decision. Though I asked an instructor later, like I told him what had happened. And I said, this is, these are the two moves I did together because I didn't want to do a stall. And uh, he said, yeah, you could have ripped your paraglider to shreds doing that kind of, putting that kind of pressure on it. So you were just lucky. Uh, so that was all to say that I was trying to impress somebody. Yeah, <laughs> it's not a good I get thing. it. From there, it doesn't seem like that big of a leap to get into the wingsuit uh, flying, wingsuit jumping. Have you ever thought about doing that? Oh, have I thought about it? I'm obsessed with it. It's I lo- pretty cool. Oh, it's so cool. And no, I will never do it because I am, I, I'm just accident prone. I just, it's passed me by. I mean, if it had come into being when I was just a little younger, I would have picked yeah. it up. And it's kind of, thank God. Thank God. It's so cool to watch those videos when they pop up like on my Instagram or whatever and you see these guys. It's so just like elegant and graceful. And I'm sure it's unbelievably difficult to master that discipline, but it's it's so fun to watch. It's yeah, it's, it's amazing. terrifying too. I mean, they're flying, they're going so fast. It's really interesting how we as humans want to keep just pushing edges because I think flying is kind of amazing. And now People in wingsuits, they want to fly as close to a hard object as possible. I know, they're going right, yeah, they're going through like ravines and coming very close to little, you know, kind of jutting promontories and things. What is that about us that we have to like keep making it, you know, supposedly everyone's like, AI is going to make your life easier. Well, obviously that's not what we want. We're going to start like doing some weird, like risky thing in order to make our life more difficult or scary or something. I guess, the conundrum of the human condition. But (laughs) these days you're flying gyrocopters, you're riding your one wheel around San Francisco, you're surfing, and you're approaching your life a little bit differently 
as a result of this exploration that you've gone on, where it feels like adrenaline is being replaced with this pursuit of awe. Is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, it kind of snuck up on me. I, I, it really wasn't until I was writing this book that I realized how much I had changed from that sort of, I guess, daredevil youth. In the past decade or so, I had noticed that I was not as into sort of, you know, when I flew, I, I didn't love the fact when I hit rough air or I was more about like seeing coyotes below me or coming upon a really cool beach as I was flying. And I have to say the part of me thought I was getting old, <laughs> quotes, soft. soft, boring, and it bothered me. It did bother me. But it wasn't until I was writing this book uh, that I realized that it wasn't that I was getting old or soft. It was that I was getting more present in my life and I was searching for awe. It also feels like part of the discovery is realizing that it was awe all along and you were under the misapprehension that it was adrenaline. And this is something that dawns upon you as a result of this wing walking experience that you have. Yeah, I was interested. So the book covers a lot of different outdoor adventures. It can be boogie boarding or bird watching, but it also entailed scuba diving with an 80 year old and wing walking. So they, it went sort of in terms of adrenaline, I guess it ran the spectrum. So I, someone sent me a video of this biplane flying and this gray-haired woman was in the front seat and all of a sudden in the middle of the flight she gets up from the cockpit and climbs up on the wing and I realized I had to talk to this woman <laughs> uh, she, what she was doing this thing called wing walking which comes is not a thing we do these days I'm just gonna say but it is from the barnstorming days in the 1920s yeah. where didn't the FAA ban it oh recently? yeah yeah oh yes and that was actually the place where I learned mm. but it's not low-level flight. Like barnstorming was low-level flight where they had wing walkers transferring from one plane to another in midair or going from a moving car to a moving plane. So when Cynthia uh, Hicks was 71 when she did this, and she, um, she went to a place called Mason Wing Walking, the only place in the country that teaches this. And yes, they did recently, recently ban it, but not when I was writing this book. Um, and I wanted to talk to Cynthia because I was interested in what a one-time sort of exciting adventure would do for our sense of self and our neural situation. Like, you know, when people go skydiving and it sort of changes their perspective on things. So I wanted to talk to her. And she said, yeah, I mean, you wouldn't believe the courage you get when you climb up on that wing. And I thought, oh, well, I'll, I guess I have to go do it. So I went to Mason Wing Walking to do a wing walking class. And what I expected, well, first of all, I was not happy about it because I'm a pilot, so I don't want to get out of a perfectly good cockpit onto the wing of a flying plane. But we practiced all morning, these sort of five moves. And I asked, like, but what's it like at 3,000 feet when you do it? And uh, Marilyn Mason, who was our instructor and also 55 years old, which was, or yeah, she was about 50 something years mm -hmm. old, which was cool. She said, oh, don't worry. Like it's your muscle memory will take over when you're up there. You don't have to worry about it <laughs> being 3,000 feet in the air. I was like, okay. So you're just being afraid of something that hasn't happened yet. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> So, um, so, yeah, so my turn came to go wing walking and the Michael Mason, who's the uh, Maryland's husband, takes us to 3000 feet and and I'm not happy and I'm kind of nervous. What's the airspeed at that? Because I, I, I'm imagining the wind, like you step out onto the wing, you're not in a harness initially, right? No, you're you're just attached by a lanyard, by a rope. Uh-huh. We are wearing a harness, but it's attached by this. In fact, this is a funny thing. They never told us what would happen. 
there was a rope that we were attached to the plane, but they never said what would happen if we fell. You're just going to be dangling from yeah, this plane? No, and then, you know, no. How are you supposed to land? Right? I know. Oh, my God. And none of us oh. asked. We were too scared to ask. Oh, my God. <laughs> I know. But you're replaying the same mistake you made with the with the totally, paragliding I guy. Oh, like God. I would think with the firefight, like to be a pilot, to do all these things that you've done, like you have to be very rigorous with your checklists and things that you, you know, have to make sure that you're taking care of. Like it's sort of shocking that you're not asking all the questions. Is it though? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We're all sort of 10 years old uh-huh. inside. Yeah. So yeah, the wind is something they they also failed to mention the wind. And it makes a difference. I mean, you can stand up and suddenly it, the pilot's going about 60. He's, he's going, uh-huh. it's a biplane. He's flying pretty slow. He's in a gentle climb so that it can be balanced. She was right about the fact that you're, you're sort of, your mind is too um, clogged with the, your neural system is just trying to make you move, do the next hand hold and the next leg move. So fear really didn't come into it that much. It was just a weird muscle memory and you're just sort of and so I walk along the wing the way we were taught and then tie myself into the king post which is his post in the middle of the wing and um yeah I'm there it is the on, the cover, cover on the, the cover of the cover of the book like I'm just like you have to you climb up onto the top that's just terrifying I don't know how that works Anyway, I interrupted you. Keep going. No, that's okay. I, I don't know how it works either. <laughs> just suddenly I find myself there and we we snap the seatbelt to the king post and the pilot starts to do loops, hammerheads and barrel rolls. And I got to tell you, Rich, I went from the most surly wing walker to ecstatic. And after I, we landed, I, I knew adrenaline had been part of it, but there was something else and I, I didn't know what it was. And it turned out that, that what it was was awe. I had been jettisoned into awe. So awe is the feeling that we get in the face of something that's sort of bigger than us, mysterious. It's a feeling of wonder and fear and dread, little dread. And, and it's really been associated with religious experiences. But it turns out that nature is also an awe trigger. Mm-hmm. And what had happened to me, basically, is that, you know, awe is when you can't quite grasp what's going on. So it's like your neural system, all the patterns that you know don't make sense. And it certainly didn't make sense to be doing loops in midair at 3,000 feet attached by this one skinny little belt. I mean, and I think just your brain is blown. And they call all a reset button for the brain because it forces you to sort of update the templates that you have so far. And it makes us more open-minded and curious. It, mm. it turns out awe is really good for us. Awe is so tricky for me to wrap my arms around. Uh, it's like this elusive concept that I only have brief flirtations with. And I, I want more of it, but it's not something I can just go outside and spontaneously experience. And I've always sort of thought of it as an antidote to self-obsession. You know, there is a humility to it, right? I think what what is so salving about the awe experience is that it connects you with a sense of oneness and also really is telling you, like, you're not the center of the universe. Like, you may be, we were talking about this earlier, like, we all want to be, you know, the hero in the hero's journey of of our life. But there's sort of a self-focus to that that I think is also unhealthy. And, and what is healthy is a deeper appreciation and humility that we're not at the center of the universe and that there are many things at play here um, that allows you to kind of relax into your life and not take yourself so seriously. And then there's a transcendent piece to it, like Arthur Brooks talks about this, like a big pillar of happiness is having a relationship with something transcendent for that same reason, that there's a humility to it. And when you can inhabit that, you can experience awe. But for me, awe occurs when I'm out in nature, as you talk about in the book, like, and I'm running or riding my bike, I have an elevated heart rate, and I just have a deeper appreciation for 
you know, what I'm experiencing in the moment because I'm more present with myself. Um, but I still don't know that I fully could like define it. They did a study at UCSF where they took people between the ages of 60 and 80, and their goal was to cultivate awe. So the way they defined it is the feeling you get when you look at something with childlike wonder or fresh childlike eyes, I think, was the instruction that they asked each of these volunteers to do when they went on these 15-minute walks. It was for an eight-week period. So they were to amble with fresh childlike eyes. And then they sent a con control group out that goes out, walks like most of us, you know, worrying about our day, looking at our phones. And after that eight-week period, first of all, the, the all walkers began to self-report that they had less depression, less anxiety, and also other studies have shown that you have more compassion. So that's the interconnectedness part. The other thing they did, which really blew my mind, is that almost as an afterthought, they said to the all walkers, hey, could you take a selfie during the walk? And initially those selfies look like selfies usually do, the face right in the middle. But mm -hmm. as the walks progressed, those selfies changed and the person got smaller and the background got bigger, which suggested to the scientists that the all walkers were becoming, without even them, themselves knowing, more curious about the world around them and sort of had a more, a healthier understanding of their place in the world, in the wider world. They call this the small self perspective, where you understand yourself in relation to basically the universe. Mm. Yeah, it turns out that we live in a world of anti-awe devices. So our phone, our computer, all of it is narrowing our focus, making us the center of it, and making us feel powerful and in control. And it turns out that's bad for us. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to get my head around this. We all, we all sort of lament, you know, if you spend time with young children and you're, you're seeing, you know, awe in real time because everything is amazing because everything is brand new. And right. we, lo it we is lament like, new. wasn't it great when like everything was so exciting uh, and just, you know, going down the street was like an amazing adventure that it just made your life fantastic. And you're saying just simply by trying to kind of channel that you can reconnect with it. Like I'm trying to understand how I would actually practice that. Yeah, be amazed. Like look closely, be present. It was funny because I did not understand this concept of awe. I didn't really know that it was a word that would apply to me. And by the time I got to it, I was halfway through the book. But when I looked back on my adventures and I had been bird watching, I mean, hang out with bird watchers because they look at the same small brown bird with awe each time. And I also went on a walk with a woman who was 93 because I was just interested in movement. And she stopped at every like leaf and she would stop and point and say, that's where a heron's nest used to be. And we would cut across people's yards so she could see, you know, whatever flowers they had. And what I realized is that we had been on an awe walk. She was just more present and prepared to be amazed, like a bird watcher. And I think that's, we're perfectly suited for awe now at this time in our lives. I don't think I could have embraced awe as a young person. I was going too fast. I was looking outward. I was looking at what other people were thinking of me too much. And I wasn't simply present to, you know, what was around me in a real mm -hmm. way. Mm-hmm. We meditate. That's a sense yeah, of... Yeah, I mean, listen, you know, the adage is if you're completely present, like everything is awe-inspiring and amazing, right? The challenge is always like, can I get present enough to have those experiences? The modern world makes that difficult. It does. I mean, you definitely have to ditch the phone. And it's interesting the way also in this country, we're very much taught to go inside ourselves to make ourselves better. You know, like... Meditation, I think, therapy, um, or at least to have things sort of done to us, like massage and a spa. And awe is kind of the opposite of that. It's about being outward focused in a way, yeah, that, that we're not, we're mm -hmm. not good at. Mm -hmm. And then in retrospect, like looking back over all the 
experiences that you've had, is it that you realize you thought you were chasing some kind of adrenaline rush, but now you realize actually you were lured by what was behind that, which was this, you know, ability to connect with awe that those experiences provided. I think so. I hope. I don't know. I mean, yeah, I have to I mean, look back. It's hard virtu- to know. Virtuous, you know, revisionist history, right? right? I will say that <laughs> in the past, I'm happy to have a turbulence-free flight. I don't have to have an engine out that I tell everyone how I almost, because I've had those and had uh-huh. to make emergency landings. I can really find beauty in in a very, um, what would I would have considered sort of a fairly quotidian flight before. And I'm, I'm glad for that because that means everything has possibility. Let's talk about the, the pillars, uh, the five pillars uh, around embracing our later decades that you've kind of divined through, through the journey you went on to write this book. Yeah, so w- this book really is a quest about fulfilling aging. And I was sort of hoping Outdoor Adventure would be a key to that. That would be it. Yeah, and it is. I mean, I now I think I've I've proved it does serve all of the five pillars. Yeah, and those are we need them throughout our life, but they tend to fall away as we age. So we have to be really, um, really watchful um, that we we keep them. And they are community, novelty, purpose, health, and then those those were those came up a lot in in various papers that I read. But I, then I added. Um, Becca Levy's, you know, we need a positive view of our own aging as well. So those five things, it turns out that, yes, you can, you know, take, um, join a book club and you will be getting a novelty and community, but you won't be getting health. You could uh, go to the gym and you will be getting health, but you also missing a key part of what the outdoors offers in terms of that health the well-being aspect and, you know, because nature, we can, I'd like to talk a little bit about that too, that yeah, nature the, the itself. Yeah, the physiological is impact of being, being in a world where there's, outside. where there's fractals and rounded corners everywhere. Totally. Um, turns out outdoor adventure covers all those pillars. An outdoor activity covers all those pillars. And you make an adventure by the way you approach it. That's a, another thing I learned is that I really had to get schooled through the writing of this book because I did change my uh, definition of an outdoor adventure. Right. As much as it's fun to spend time with the, the base jumpers and the wing walkers, it was the bird watchers that really got you. Yeah, it was the, the outdoor activities that I thought sort of didn't really qualify as adventure, but I was going to go do You're it. Like, every- but I need to make this book for everybody. Yeah. I realize like, you know, my firefighting thing isn't for... <laughs> yeah. Every yeah. 65 year old woman who's going to read this book. We're flying a gyrocopter. So I, so. You, did you sort of explore that begrudgingly? Like, res, you know, like, well, I guess I'll go do this, but this is probably not going to make its way into the book. Well, no, I, I kind of knew, for instance, so walking uh, outdoors. I wanted movement in the book. I wanted to talk about how important just mere movement was and walking is something we could do as we aged. And of course, when I went on this walk with Dot Fisher Smith, who was 93, I began to realize there's just so much more than just movement to this. And it's not an, it wasn't an adventure, I thought, but it had to be in the book because we could all do it. Well, it turns out that it was an adventure. I mean, walking with Dot Fisher Smith, who basically, like I said, first of all, she cuts across everybody's yard. So you're totally in danger of being shot. She wanted like grass under her feet the Uh whole time. (laughs) Um, but she also, you know, again, as I said, stops and looks at everything. She quotes poetry. We, I didn't know where we were going. I thought we were going to go in a straight line to this pond. And we ended up going in this very vertiginous way because she wanted, she just went where the universe seemed to tell her to go, basically. Adventure is up to you to define. It doesn't have to be some peak experience. It's a peak experience for you. So as long as it's tapping your inner explorer and you're feeling exhilaration and there's some physical vitality and maybe a little pushing your comfort zone, it's an adventure for Mm -hmm. you. So we're going to have different. um, So it's not about the activity itself, I guess is what I'm saying. It's about the way you approach and absorb that activity. The novelty piece is interesting. Obviously, when you're engaging your mind in something new, 
you're creating new neural pathways. It's good for cognition, brain health, all these sorts of things. But as we get older, like I'm just thinking about dating, for example, like the older, I can't imagine dating now, like the older I get, the more set in my ways I am and the kind of less tolerance I have for doing things that I don't want to do. You know, it's like, no, I I just don't have time to do anything that like at my age, like I'm only going to choose to invest in things that you know, I like doing basically, I guess my point being that that creates some resistance to novelty that we don't have when we're younger. So novelty being one of these key pillars of aging, like means getting out of your comfort zone and putting yourself in situations that, that you wouldn't otherwise. And they don't have to be huge leaps, but they do have to be new kind of challenges is maybe the wrong word, but experiences that are fresh. I actually think, I mean, it, while we know the science says our brains are plastic and they keep growing, we still use that excuse, I'm too old. So there's part of us that believes that we, that we are, our brain is too hardened. So, but that's not true. And, and we can learn. When I was doing this book, I asked people, when was the last time you learned something new? And my friends were all like, not really, uh, not recently. And part of it is because we, we think we know who we are and we do, and that's good. But embracing something new can be can open up your life in ways so i i interviewed vijaya srivastava who learned to swim Mm -hmm. at 68 you know that's that's a Mm -hmm. feat right yeah it's hard it's hard to learn how to swim and she didn't do it like because she wanted to be a better person and she wanted her brain to to have laid out new neural pathways she basically did it because her doctor said hey you need to get some exercise I don't think I've ever met anybody who had had the less experience in the outdoors. She didn't even have a walking practice, not even a tiny one. She grew up in India and she told me that she played badminton like three times and that was it. And when she moved to the United States, she still didn't. But somehow, and again, I, this happened a lot with women who picked up an outdoor activity later in life. It often happened at an inflection point. So a time in their life where they were sort of open to this idea of doing something that they didn't think fit their identity. When a doctor says you need, you know, to get some exercise, often older people do that. And so she had a pool at her condominium complex and she had seen people, kids in there having fun. She just didn't think it was for her. Mm -hmm. And so she started taking swim lessons. It's a cool story. But my favorite story or chapter in the book is the one around your mom. Mm. Yeah, mine too. Not only does she decide to go skydiving at 54. 52, I think. Yeah, 52, like uh, which is a crazy story because she decided she didn't want to do a tandem jump. Like she wanted to go full <laughs> bore. And this is like, she's not exactly you, right? Like this was no. not in her comfort zone at all. No, no, she had no, she was not an outdoors person yeah. at all. But I think more striking is when she takes up cycling later on and how that changes her life. Yeah, she, she moved to a new town at 62 because she, and she had broken up with her boyfriend of 20 years. So this, was a, this again, was an mm-hmm. inflection point. And she didn't know anyone in the town and she had a bicycle and there was a group and she thought maybe this is, a, this is more of a distraction for her so that she could sort of settle in. And... She surprised herself by loving biking, cycling. And we saw the change in her through this as her kids. I don't think we were prepared to give her the the acclaim that she deserved for such a big undertaking, like starting a whole new physical thing. She was someone who thought of herself as someone who was not brave. She actually thought she was not brave, a very timid person. And yet here she was taking up bicycling mm-hmm. at 62 and she began to plan rides she became she became part an integral part of this group healthier stronger more confident there was this virtuous feedback loop when everyone heard about her trips that again she was upending her own expectations of herself and that's really powerful i love that after she did the skydive jump, she got the sticker from the school or whatever and put it on the car, put it on the car. 
and then wouldn't cop to the fact that she just wanted to flex a little bit while she drove around town. We teased um, her too, and that wasn't yeah. very nice of us. <laughs> We're like, oh, mom, yeah. so you want to tell everyone you're, yeah. she's like, no, I just want to know that I can, f- it makes it easier to find my car in a parking lot. But then she tells you later that the plane that she jumped out of, like some weeks later, crashed. And yeah. people died. The as whole a result Danish of that. skydiving team, who she had been in the plane with when she did her di- her jump, they had been in there with her, and they died a couple of weeks later wow. when that plane crashed. Yeah, I think it just cemented. I mean, it was a terrible thing, and she told it to me in such a matter of fact way. I mean, she is British. It kind of cemented that what she had done was very brave. And mm-hmm. I asked her if that that's again one thing, and how does that change you? Well, she had she sort of had not just jumped out of a plane, but she sort of jumped a chasm of her own understanding of herself. Like suddenly, it wasn't that she was a brave person. She didn't think that, but she had now done a brave thing. And that, I do draw a through line from that moment to when she picked up a bicycle. Because I feel like anytime you do those things, they just keep... um, They build on each other, right? Would she have picked up cycling had she not yeah, I don't jumped know. out of a plane, who knows, but maybe less likely. But the other piece, well, two thoughts. First of all, the other piece with cycling is the community piece. Like that, that's the other pillar because she's not riding alone. She's with this group, right? She's a part of this, this club and she's getting to know all these people her age in a town where she didn't know anybody. And what she loves about it is that Unlike a cocktail party, like if she doesn't like anybody, she can just she, like the person she's talking to you right away. And it's, it's true, like you can have a conversation, but then you can be like, I, then you can just like stop talking. It's not all the etiquette around like heightened social situations, parties and stuff like that is not present in that. And it just makes it kind of easier to be with people in a more natural way. And then, of course, you have nature. So it's, it's like serving all of these masters at once. But together, like the skydiving and the cycling, to your point, is, is fueling the mindset piece, which, you know, is that not the most important one, right? How we think about ourselves and what is our relationship with our aging bodies? Yeah, I think our beliefs can be really hidden. And, and so they can start working on us in ways we don't know. So when you step outside, you don't have to be like, I'm about to change my belief. It just kind of, you, yeah, just by doing it. Um, And it turns out what I realized is when I began writing this book, I was talking to friends and I could see that they were very disheartened about their own aging. And actually, I wasn't. And it wasn't until I started interviewing my mom again that I realized, oh, she's been my own Dr. Ellen Langer prime. Like she's been that prism through which I've seen aging and that filter and it's good. I mean, I saw my mom blossom at a later age and really embrace life and have a community and feel a part of something and become more social than she ever had, become more expressive of emotions than she ever had. And so she herself was my own positive subliminal aging mm-hmm. message. Mm-hmm. Now she has Parkinson's. She yeah. does, yeah. I mean, but she wrote until what, she was 80? Almost, almost 80, 80. yeah. And really fun trips. Like we, we were like, wow, this is aging. They'd go and do these weekend trips uh, at these cool places. And yeah, it was really inspiring. Mm-hmm. I'm not that I would have told her that at the time. <laughs> Let's spend a minute on purpose. Sure. Uh, because I think that becomes an increasingly acute crisis with people as they get older, when they start to lose a sense of what their purpose is. Yeah, it's it's one of the big things, I think. I mean, um, you know, you've retired, kids are out of the house, and certainly as women, we're dropped in a very gray area of what we're supposed to, to do. I was interested in purpose when I interviewed Louise Holy, who was a scuba diver, because she did a lot of, um, a lot of her scuba diving she did for a nonprofit. So she would count kelp stipe because kelp is actually endangered now it's under a lot of pressure now because of climate change and she would count fish at particular you know areas and she picked up trash in lake tahoe and lake tahoe 
is like 41 degrees or 47 degrees. It's incredibly cold and difficult to dive. And so she said that that, you know, gave her a sense of purpose and belonging. Mm. So if somebody's listening to this and they're of that age or nearing that age and starting to wonder, you know, what purpose might look like, how does one explore that? It looked different with every activity that I went to explore, but there was always an element of purpose. So when I was boogie boarding, this one woman I spoke to had had cancer. And she, when she recovered, she told herself that what she wanted to do was make sure that she lived life fully and that she helped others live life fully. And then, incidentally, she joined this, the Wave Chasers. And t- she told me, in fact, boogie boarding, it completely um, fulfills that purpose. Because here I am in the water with people, um, and we're completely present to the elements and each other, and we're having so much fun. And so her purpose was being played out right there. Mm-hmm. So I suppose it's a, it's a reflection on, on how you can marry some kind of outdoor activity that that fulfills that need to feel purposeful in your day? Like, I'm just trying to get a sense of like how one might define that, that for themselves. And let's say like your mom, never done anything. This is all very scary, uh, but you know, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with my time. The kids are gone. How do I even get off the couch here and take that first step? Well, I mean, with my mom, she, she was head biking. So she knew that the purpose that she was fulfilling actually was, it sounds kind of banal, but it's actually really important. She was part of this group and she would pl- help plan the rides and she's like part of the experience for everybody. And that's, that's actually what life's about. Like those small, very powerful interactions you have with others who you like or love. But I would say that when you sort of try to go out and find purpose, it can be kind of difficult. Yeah, it's daunting. Yeah. I am looking for my purpose. Right. right? And I think it's just, it's like developing a reflex towards action, you know, like just doing things and purpose kind of evolves as a product of exploring novelty and adventure and all of the other things that you well, talk yeah, about. Well, yeah, like for instance, Virginia Rose, who I interviewed, who is a bird watcher. And I was interested in bird watching because it wasn't an adventure. <laughs> At least so I thought, um, but it was something that most of us could do as we aged because it's bird watching. And Virginia Rose actually had been in a wheelchair since she was 14. And she found bird watching quite late um, and completely head over heels in love with it. She was a firecracker of a woman and people were surprised that she would like bird watching, but she really found herself in bird watching. And then she found her purpose, which was to introduce bird watching to other people with disabilities. So she has her own mm. nonprofit mm-hmm. called Birdability, where she takes people outside. But I, she wasn't looking for purpose. I mean, she was already an English teacher. She probably had a lot of purpose in her life, too. But now at 65, I think she is, she has a lot of purpose. I mean, she introduces people, she, she opens up people's lives in ways that. <laughs> I mean, none of us do. Yeah, that's but, beautiful. Yeah. Let's talk about nature and the Let's talk about benefits nature. of, you know, immersing ourselves in the outdoors. Yeah. I mean, I knew I felt good after I came in from the outdoors. But again, like there's, I, I knew so little when I started this book. And when I started to do research, one of my first interviews was with Sean Brokeman, who's a base jumper. And she is 52. She's not what you think a base jumper should be. She's a kindergarten teacher. Um, She's a grandmother. Uh, She's African-American. She's female. She's 52. And I was really interested in in talking to her. I actually didn't think I would include in the book, frankly, because it was too adventurous. Right, too extreme. Yeah, and it was the one thing I didn't do. Unrelatable. Um, But it happened to coincide with when we were having the fires, uh, well... Okay, that's that could, that could be any time now, but there was a, a series of really bad fires in California that were completely blanketing the air and the visibility would drop to very little. And we were in the pandemic and I was depressed. And 
I went to accompany Sean. I was her ground crew on a base jump with her and her husband and a friend. And after two days in a national park, I felt so much better. And that's really when I started to do research on the medicinal aspects of getting outside. So it's great to work out in a gym, but there's nothing like being outside uh, when you work out or for well-being. So the science is pretty unequivocal. I mean, from the tree chemicals that are emitted that lower our cortisol and our blood pressure to birdsong that improves our memory and improves our mood. And they think that that's because if birds are singing, our sort of uh, reptilian brain knows that there's no predators about, so mm. we relax. Oh, that's wild. Mm -hmm. There's so much busyness that our brain has to do, so much filtering of noise it has to do in a more urban environment or indoors or when you're on your, your computer, that we're constantly at this sort of low-level anxiety. It takes up a lot of space. And it turns out that people who take a walk outside in green space, when they come back, they test better on memory and cognitive tests because your brain isn't working that hard. We need rest. A workout is useless unless you're resting at some point and rebuilding. And that's what our brain needs. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that I found really interesting is that the soft shapes of nature, like horizon lines and hills and the fractal elements of nature match well with our retinal structure. And that means that there's a lot of ease in processing when we're outside. So again, a lot of rest for the brain. So on all these different levels, going outside is really important for our physiology mm -hmm. and our well-being. On the one hand, it's, it's very affirming to hear all that. And on the other <laughs> hand, I'm thinking human beings are insane. Like we have to do science on this to <laughs> figure out whether being outdoors is good. <laughs> you know? It's worse than that, actually. In other countries, they actually have sort of put aside outdoors for this well-being experiment. Because right. they realize their citizens are completely stressed. So not only that, do they put aside green space... But there's signs to tell us what to do on this trail. Like uh -huh. maybe now you should like look at this incredible lake and do some stretches and some breathing. Like, right. like we're, we're ridiculous. Identify the fractals. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know? Stare at the fractal <laughs> nature of that. Um, but it's cool that science can actually verify this with like metrics saying, look, it lowers your blood pressure or, you know, the bird song thing is wild. And, you know, it is allowing- Crushing like, water, the, the same. Yeah, it's relaxing, you know, the frenetic brain waves and allowing your brain to kind of heal and reset and reboot. Yeah, it's really important. Mm -hmm. And sadly, I mean, we, it, this is the kind of science we need to tell people because they've done a lot of studies on what happens when nature begins to recede to people. And it's our health just diminishes very, very quickly. I mean, the deaths rise in that area when you start logging mm -hmm. trees. And part of it is that, yes, um, you know, the CO2 exchange is different, but it's, it's a lot of different things interacting, including our depression. You've said that this book is your version of a climate change book. It's sort of betwixt in between the lines, though. Yeah, because there's, there's people who can do the climate change stuff better than me and um, with more authority and credibility. But I guess my exhortation is that we is to get outside, but also we won't save something unless we love it and we think we need it. And so that's, that's where Tough Broad falls. Mm -hmm. Carrying on the family tradition of activism. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Can we talk a little bit about writing process? Yeah, I'd love to. When do you know that you have an idea that's worthy of a book? So when I wrote, I wrote Lost Cat, which mm -hmm. is this tiny, tiny book illustrated by my lovely, lovely ex-wife, Wendy McNaughton. And I love that book so much. Uh, but initially, that book was actually a proposal that I sent out about, it was a book I wanted to write after I had a really bad accident in one of my experimental aircraft. I was on the couch for like three months, but I was immobile and very restricted for about a year. And I was really interested in injury and depression and illness. <laughs> Sounds exciting, <laughs> right? <laughs> So I would, I, I would tell this story of my um, being on the couch and being depressed and the interplay of 
painkillers with and people's eyes would just glaze Who wants over. To read this. Yeah, exactly. And then I would come to this moment in my story where my cat disappears and how my cat disappeared for five weeks and I went, I was really depressed and sad. And then he came back and then I went crazy and I went on this series of where did my cat go? And I put a GPS camera on him and I put a video camera and I went to an animal communicator to find out where he went when he was gone. And I was telling the story to these people because I wanted to show how crazy I was. And again, depression, illness, (laughs) and their eyes just lit up at the cat part. Nothing else but the cat part. And I was like, oh, that's the book I should write. Mm. So partly it's, you know, you got to sort of claw your way out of your own stuff and write the book that other people are interested. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not that artist who just writes for herself. I am Mm -hmm. actually trying to communicate. With Tough Broad, I knew that this was not going to be a book of biopics of, you know, cool women. It is that, too. It is individual stories of Was that part of the of initial women. idea, like, I'm going to just find all these badass women? And never. Never. I never wanted to write that book, but I had to be really careful, and I could not find my way into that. It took me a long time to make sure I was writing a book that was actually about fulfilling aging and the outdoors and all those themes. And then the women would just bring that to life. Yeah. So it's sort of a process of understanding um, it's what would speak to people. It's that spark in their eye. Part of your process is is participating in this writer's group, right? The writer's grotto. Yeah. So I'm really curious, like what what need does that fulfill? Is it accountability, feedback? Is it just community, like being with other people who are, you know, fighting the fight and in that struggle? It's sort of all of that. I mean, I joined in 1999. I knew very few writers. I had ju- I'd written Fighting Fire, but I had known no writers really before that. And then suddenly I'm around writers and it's partly that We just want to get out of our pajamas Mm -hmm. (laughs) during the day and go to an office space. So the Writer's Grotto was definitely an office space that I went to. After the pandemic, that's kind of changed. But it's also knowing what's possible, seeing it in another person. So the the Grotto is kind of amazing in how many New York Times bestsellers, how many um, Pulitzer Prize and National Book Award people it's actually had in its halls. And I I don't think that's because When I started, there was just nine of us, and nobody was a writer of any note. And now it's like Poe Bronson, Mary Roach, you know, Noah Hawley. Mm. These were all grotto people who were nobodies initially. Of course, we're all at one point nobodies, but there's something about people in um, in a group that can be really bad if it's really homogenous, and it can be scary because I think we can become very insulated. But there's also some really powerful things that can come out of people together in a group. It's this energy of seeing what's possible, again, when somebody else does it. Routinely at the Grotto, people will start off as poets, and then they'll see, uh, they'll start being friends with somebody who's a nonfiction writer, and then they become an incredible nonfiction writer. Mm. I mean, yeah, it's partly energetic. It's partly, maybe it's mindset that suddenly you have a, positive view about right all these other people seem to be doing it like why can't i like it raises the floor on and the ceiling on what you what might be possible for you and we trade knowledge like we trade numbers are there like meetings is it like a is are there formal like sessions where you're sitting down and sharing stuff or is it just people in a kind of co-working space where informally like you're it's it's a little but i mean you, you know we have to have chores and sort of make the place run but the Co-creativity happens more informally. Like mm. you start, you meet people at lunch and you, you, you realize, oh, wow, that's cool what they're doing. I mean, one of the things that keeps writers down is that we don't talk plainly about our advances and the way, you know, people are rejecting bus- our work. The business or, part. Yeah, because, and I think the publishing industry can keep us down by you know, not, we don't know what the bar should be for our advance. And people accept advances that are way too low for who they are. So I think the grotto is really, um, first of all, it has a motto of all boats 
what is it? <laughs> that dumb thing that Obviously, we all know. Like, yeah, a that rising I'm supposed tide to know. raises all boats. And, and that is, even though I don't know mm-hmm. the quote, that is what I we don't know believe. Who, who knows who said that? Yeah, we try not to be competitive at all, and be, and we all show up for each other's readings. And there's just a sense like we're here for you, because otherwise, writing is a lonely business. You know, sure, sure. You know, it's like you're in. Yeah, your, that's cool. I'm jealous. I would, I would love to be part of something like that. It's inspiring. And it's always tricky. Like who are the people that uh, I'm going to reach out to for feedback? Who are the people that I should avoid for that reason? Like you have to be careful about these things and, you know, choose your allies uh, judiciously. And when you work with them, you start to know, you know, who's who and, you know, what they can offer. So Bonnie is one of my... Mm -hmm. I was going to ask, is is Bonnie part of the the group? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's how I met her. And uh, we, we... we surf together. She's an amazing surfer, much better than me. <laughs> but she, she's also one of my first readers, and uh, and I am hers. Mm, so that's cool. We're talking about Bonnie Soy, who wrote uh, Why who wrote We Why swim. We Swim, who was Sarah on the, the podcast a couple of years ago. Yeah. yeah, she's she's lovely, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, cool. Final thing about writing. So on a day to day process, like what is it? look like? How much of it is outlining? How much of it is free form? How much of it is putting on the editor's brain? Like, how do you break that down into like a schedule? I'm pretty disciplined, so I don't worry about getting a book done. I probably shouldn't say that because I, I, I often don't worry about getting a book done. Um, but what I, in order to crack a book, I need to understand its structure. So that's what I work on first. And in order to do that, I just start writing and, it, and I'm okay if it's terrible because I'll start understanding the structure of it. So the structure of Tough Broad, for instance, is um, based on parts of the, it's mind, mm-hmm. body, spirit, you know, so it's, it's sort of the body, the, the human, that's how I structured it even though it's dealing with community, purpose, health, novelty, but it's situated in things like the brain. You know, the brain section has memory, but it also has novelty in it. Mm -hmm. So once I have the structure, and then I have to have the voice. So finding the voice. And again, that just means I'm writing, and it's it's just a rough draft. And I'm not afraid to write badly, because I don't really have high hope expectations of myself, luckily. Again, like that thing that I'm not necessarily good at everything, but I'm just dogged. So, and then I, they have a deadline. So I'm very much somebody who, I don't do words by day um, because sometimes that means that I can't fly or I can't Mm -hmm. one wheel or, but I have a deadline and that deadline, I meet that deadline. Because I'm very much somebody who's goal oriented and I know you are too. Like I, I need to write it down. I need to see it. It's a how many by when. So I need to have, you know, this book needs to be done by, you know, August 5th. Right, right. Pilots don't miss deadlines. <laughs> no. By nature, yeah, right? Exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Are you already at work on the next one? Do you yeah. know what the next one is? Yes, I can. Yeah, of course you won't disclose. <laughs> um, and what is, if any, you know, adventures lying in your near future? In my near future, I'm planning to fly my gyrocopter to um, somewhere east, towards the east this time. Uh, or sorry, sorry, more east. So it's a, to um, Salt Lake City, I think, is where we uh, want to go. What is the, we were talking about this at the outset, but I still am not sure. Like, how far can you fly before you have to refuel? Well, you kind of only want to fly about an hour and a half in the air because it's open Uh cockpit and you're you're constantly, you know, your brain is working hard and so is your body from all the wind and the sun. So every hour and a half, I find a little airport to land in and refuel. So getting to Salt Lake is, that's a, that's a big, that's a big trip. I think so. You're I stopping haven't every hour, and a, hour, hour <laughs> yeah. and a half, right? I, well, usually yeah. I usually go, yeah, in a trip, when I went to S- Sedona, I probably stopped at 20 airports. Yeah, very cool. All right, well, final thoughts on, on the book and this notion of, you know, embracing the beauty and the possibilities uh, that abound as we enter into our 50s and 60s and beyond. Again, for the person who's new to these ideas or is entertaining the possibility of 
welcoming some novelty and some nature into their lives. Like, again, like what is the, what is the first impulse? Is it taking a walk? Is it calling a friend and saying like, hey, let's go on a hike? So it's a small step, whatever it is. Don't suddenly go wing walking. Um, but Sean Brokeman, the base jumper, is also a personal trainer. And she trains women who are often older women, over 40, 50, 60. And she often sa- asks them, what did you do when you were a kid? What did you like when you were a kid? And sometimes that can hold the key to what maybe you will like now. But it might just be as simple as, oh, I have a friend who does X, you know, she, she has a, a little sit on top kayak and I could go with her and trying that. Um, bring a friend because that really helps to be accountable, but just get outside any mm-hmm. way you can and get outside further the next time. Excellent. Beautifully put. The book is Tough Broad. It's a real act of service. Uh, I think it's a, a, a vital book that is very much of the moment, and I appreciate you writing it. Thanks. I really I appreciate it. reflect being... on my own <laughs> with 60 in my near horizon. Yeah, everyone's going to um, say this is the best decade. Yeah, I feel I'm happy. Like, I'm as happy as I've ever been. See? Yeah. Like I'm, I can't wait for that yeah, book, yeah. Rich. Can you write uh, the book that I couldn't write? Because, you know, I was like, well, I think I'm just going to, I mean, men get a lot out of this book, but maybe they're waiting for you to write a version. Yeah. Uh, I'm working on one. It's a little bit different than that, but we can talk about it. If you, can I make a guest appearance at the Writer's Grotto? <laughs> yeah, they let you in or is it definitely. like, is it like the Bohemian Grove or something like that? It's like <laughs> a, shrouded in secrecy. Um, anyway, we can chat about that uh, later. But anyway, thank you for coming today. I just want to, you know, acknowledge like the work that you're doing on behalf of, of not just women, but, but everybody. And it's really a beautiful accomplishment. So thank you. I really appreciate you, Rich. Yeah. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Peace. That's it for today. Thank you for listening. I truly hope you enjoyed the conversation. To learn more about today's guest, including links and resources related to everything discussed today, visit the episode page at richroll.com where you can find the entire podcast archive, my books, Finding Ultra, Voicing Change in the Plant Power Way, as well as the Plant Power Meal Planner at meals.richroll.com. If you'd like to support the podcast, the easiest and most impactful thing you can do is to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, and on YouTube, and leave a review and or comment. This show just wouldn't be possible without the help of our amazing sponsors who keep this podcast running wild and free. To check out all their amazing offers, head to richroll.com slash sponsors. And sharing the show or your favorite episode with friends or on social media is, of course, awesome and very helpful. And finally, for podcast updates, special offers on books, the meal planner, and other subjects, please subscribe to our newsletter, which you can find on the footer of any page at richroll.com. Today's show was produced and engineered by Jason Camiolo. The video edition of the podcast was created by Blake Curtis, with assistance by our creative director, Dan Drake. Portraits by Davey Greenberg. Graphic and social media assets, courtesy of Daniel Solis. And thank you, Georgia Whaley, for copywriting and website management. And of course, our theme music was created by Tyler Pyatt, Trapper Pyatt, and Harry Mathis. Appreciate the love. Love the support. See you back here soon. Peace. Plants. Namaste.